So we will begin the program in two to three minutes to allow attendees to join the event. So good morning, everyone. My name is Nagai Pindell, and I'm the Dean of the Peter A. Allard School of Law at UBC. Before we, before we begin today's program, I would like to acknowledge that UBC's campuses at Point Grey and Robeson Square are situated on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. I would also like to acknowledge that you may be joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. If you experience any technical difficulties, please reach out via Zoom chat for assistance. Please be sure to direct your question to the host. We have additional colleagues on the line whose webcams are turned off, but they are assisting on the back end. Also, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box to submit uh, for our speaker throughout the webinar. I would like to welcome everyone to the 16th annual J. Donald Mawinney Lecture in Professional Ethics. This lectureship is one of the leading lectures in Canada on the topic of legal ethics, and it allows the Allard School of Law to emphasize the critical importance of maintaining ethical standards in the legal profession. This endowed lecture was established in 2005 to recognize J. Donald Mawinney's outstanding contributions to the British Columbia legal community, his commitment to legal education, and his dedication to practicing with the very highest standard of professional ethics. Mr. Mawinney was an alumnus of the law school graduating in 1954. He articled at Ladner Downs, now Bordner at Ladner Gervais, became a partner in 1959, and acted as managing partner from 1976 to 1978. In 1980, he and Howard Callow, QC, established Mawinney and Callow. Over a period of 10 years, the firm grew to 28 lawyers whose primary focus was business law. In the 1990s, the firm merged with Fraser Mildner Casgrain, now Denton's. Mr. Mawinney served as vice chairman of the firm until 1994. Mr. Merwini was a firm believer in community service and served as vice chair and then chairman of university and Shaughnessy hospitals. This lectureship would not be possible without the generous support of those who contributed to the endowment and the hard work of Mr. Merwini's son, Mark Merwini, who was the driving force behind the special tribute to his father. Mark is an associate portfolio manager and investment advisor with Adlam Brown and Victoria and he is an alumnus of UBC. Like his father, he has a very strong commitment to community service. He is currently the vice chair of the Greater Victoria Harbor Authority Board of Directors, and has previously sat on the boards of the UBC Alumni Association, Destination Greater Victoria, and chaired the boards of the Victoria Dragon Boat Festival and the Fairway George 
uh, Paddling Club. I would now like to invite Mark to say a few words. Thanks very much, uh, Dean Pindell. It's a pleasure for me to um, participate each year uh, by making a few introductory remarks. Um, I'm doing so today from my car in Nanaimo as I'm up here visiting with some clients, which is a neat development in how we're living our lives through technology now, isn't it? Uh, this, this lecture series um, really began with uh, a boy, me, um, wanting to uh, do something for his dad um, that would show my appreciation for his guidance and his mentorship uh, and his friendship. And uh, way back in, in 2002, 2003, uh, I had reached out to um, the then Dean Babinski and uh, thought that it might be nice to raise some money in his name um, uh, for the Faculty of Law, which he held near and dear to his heart. As you pointed out, Dean, um, he loved the law. Uh, he loved the profession of law. Um, he was very committed to uh, legal ethics and professionalism, uh, which is why when Dean Babinski suggested this as um, the basis of the lecture series, I was certainly very excited uh, for it because I knew that ultimately my father would be as well. And I like to tell a little story each year, if you wouldn't mind, about um, how this really applied to me in my everyday life. I my dad was a single dad and like all of you, he had a very, very demanding profession. Um, but he was a wonderful father and a wonderful friend. And, and one of the ways that he was terrific was he uh, always was uh, very consistent in teaching me uh, about ethics, about integrity and about honesty. And I remember in my early teens, I used to work in the mail room and the photocopy room in my dad's law firm, Mawinnie and Kello. And uh, uh, I guess I was 16, I was driving myself to work, which is what a 16 year old of an independent spirit wants to do. And he pointed out to me that I hadn't been paying for parking in the parking garage. And I was thrilled because I said, oh dad, it's been great. I haven't paid all summer. Um, and I could be towed now three or four times and I'd still come out ahead financially. And he just looked at me quizzically and he said, well, why would you do that? And he wasn't angry, he wasn't upset, he just was quizzical. He said, I, I don't understand why you would do that. And I said, well, why do you ask the question? And he, he said something very simple. He said, because it's wrong. And I remember that to this day, I'm 48 now and I was 16 at the time. And how that's applied to me over the course of life is whenever, um, whenever I'm tempted to do the wrong thing, lessons from him ring around in my head like that one. And I think that more often than not, I end up making the right choice because of those many lessons. And I know, um, having come to know a lot of the acolytes that my dad helped train over the course of time, many of whom have gone on to great professional success, he had a similar impact on the profession uh, through his mentorship and guidance of young lawyers as they came up in the profession. And I think that, and these aren't my words, I've heard, certainly heard it from others, the profession is better as a result of that. And so I'm really appreciative of, of Dean Babinski and I'm, I'm appreciative of you, Dean Pindell, um, for keeping the lecture series alive. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to have this moment each year to remember my dad uh, and to think about him and to appreciate him. Um, and I'm particularly thrilled about the topic this year, which is a really timely topic. Uh, so kudos to all of you for keeping it current. Uh, and thank you again. I hope you enjoy the lecture. Well, thank you, Mark, uh, for, for those words and, and for the, uh, the thoughts about your father. Uh, he truly was a remarkable man from all that I've, I've heard. Um, so with that, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Amy Salazen, who is an associate professor in the Faculty of Law, Common Law section at the University of Ottawa, and a faculty member of the Center for Law, Technology, and Society. She received her JSD from Yale Law School, for a dissertation exploring the judicial regulation of lawyers and common law jurisdictions. She also received her LLM from Yale Law School and her JD from the University of Toronto. Amy has written extensively in the area of legal ethics, lawyer regulation, the use of technology and the delivery of legal services and access to justice. Having now published over 15 articles in Canadian and international peer reviewed journals on the topic. 
Amy is currently the president of the Canadian Association for Legal Ethics. So for today's program, Professor Salazin will speak for uh, or until about 12.15, and then we will commence the Q&A portion of our event. And with that, please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Amy Salazin. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for that, that warm welcome and also to Mark for sharing um, those stories about your dad. I really appreciated getting to know a little bit more about him. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here to present the J. Donald Mawinney Lectureship in Professional Ethics. Um, this lectureship has hosted so many interesting, important discussions about professional ethics over the years, 16 years, um, and I'm very grateful for the generosity that's facilitated these discussions. And grateful to be invited here this year to speak to you and to you all for taking time out of your busy Fridays to um, come listen about uh, a topic in legal ethics for a while. As noted in the, uh, in the advertisement on the screen, I will be talking about a lawyer's duty of technological competence. And again, as the Dean just indicated, I'll take roughly 35 minutes or so. And then I hope we have lots of time for questions, your feedback, your perspective, as we get to the end of the presentation. Uh, so in terms of uh, what that next 35 minutes is gonna look like, uh, first I will talk about um, what does it mean to say that a lawyer has a duty of technological competence? And then second, looking ahead, what might this duty look like going forward? Uh, in terms of how I approach these topics, I'm guessing there's a diversity of experience in the room, people with different levels of knowledge about technology, people occupying different roles, students, lawyers, people in non-legal roles. Um, so I've tried to put together something that will resonate broadly to the audience. I hope I've, I've met that mark. Um, but again, we'll have time at the end if there's questions about things that were unclear or if people wanna add their own perspective, maybe you have expertise on something I'm talking about, I'm certainly glad to, to hear that as well. So on to the, the first uh, topic here. What is this duty of technological competence that lawyers have? Where did it come from? So the big marker in this discussion is in Canada is 2019. Um, in 2019, the Federation of Law Societies of Canada added new commentary about technological competence to its model code of professional conduct. And this is the model code that tends to influence the individual provincial and territorial codes that get adopted in each jurisdiction. How did they get there? Um, a bit of a timeline on the screen. I won't read through it in detail. Um, one thing I think of interest to note is that several years before we did this in Canada, you'll see in uh, um, 2012, the American Bar Association amended its model code to include a duty of technological competence. And then several years later, that was done in Canada. As of now, the, the American um, rule has been adopted in 39 states, so pretty widely adopted. In Canada, we've seen a majority of the law societies also incorporating this amendment into their provincial um, codes of conduct. Will we see all law societies go there? Um, I can't I'll predict the future in that way. Um, I do know the jurisdiction, I am a, a member of the Law Society Ontario, has not yet adopted that duty. Uh, British, British Columbia has not yet either. Um, and we'll just have to wait to see what happens in those jurisdictions. Um, but I would note that most places have adopted it since it came into the Federation Code in 2019. Um, to situate ourselves, what was actually adopted? Um, first thing to note is we have this general duty as lawyers, of course, to be competent. When I teach this to my students, I always make a bit of a joke about the, the rule you see on the screen there, which basically says in order to be a competent lawyer, you must be competent. Um, that rule itself doesn't provide much information. But we do see if you look at the rules or if you have looked at the rules before, you'll know underneath this section, there's a bunch of subsections, commentary, that really try and provide more guidance to lawyers about what it means to be competent when you're delivering legal services. And, that, and that's where you'll, you'll find this new commentary. It's within kind of that explanatory part of the rule. Um, this is a new commentary. I won't read it out to you. And certainly uh, a PowerPoint design person would say it's too much text for the slide, but I wanted to give you the whole rule. Um, what I'd highlight here is that you'll see that uh, within this commentary, it does say that lawyers need to use relevant technology. 
They need to understand benefits and risks associated with such technology. Uh, but it's also understood, particularly when you go to that 4B part, that this duty is dependent on what technology is reasonably available to the lawyer. And that commentary says that's going to depend on the firm's practice area, geographically where you're located, uh, what your clients need. So that's on the screen there, the new duty of technological competence that you may have heard of and that animates this presentation. Um, I've just said this is a new duty, um, but one thing to also note, and I'll speak about this in the next few slides, is there's a lot of ways in which the, this new duty has already had predecessors in existing rules and existing recognitions from judges and elsewhere. So in some ways we can question, is this really a new duty, so to speak? One thing to note is that within longstanding existing professional conduct rules, there's a way in which you can see an implied duty of technological competence. Here's just a few examples on the screen there. Um, lawyers do have a duty to provide efficient legal services. And so you can think if a lawyer doesn't use a particular technology because they're uncomfortable with it, they're unfamiliar with it, and as a result provides inefficient legal services, well, they're perhaps violating this duty. If a lawyer, for example, doesn't want to use computerized databases, doesn't want to look up case law in Ken Lee, uh, only exclusively uses print reporters, they take 10, 20, 30 extra hours to do their legal research, is that really consistent with the duty to provide efficient legal services? And then moving to the second bullet point, if you then translate that into a bill for the client, is that really consistent with a duty of charging fair and reasonable fees? Now, even more specifically to the idea of technology, that third bullet point, it's always been recognized that this duty of competence, the general duty evolves, that includes adapting to changing professional standards, techniques, and practices. And we can think now the several ways in which using technology is mandatory, uh, ways in which you need to use it and use it well to be competent. Some courts may now mandate electronic filing. In real estate practices, you may, it may be necessary to electronically register property. Um, more and more, you may need to attend court or tribunals virtually. All these things implicate a, duty, a lawyer's duty of competence, even if we don't have that additional commentary added on. And then on the last bullet point, we can think of the various technology-based risks to client information. That includes risks related to malicious actors, but also risks related to inadvertent disclosures. So does a lawyer know what metadata is and how not to accidentally send it to an opposing party? Do they know what precautions they need to take when they're crossing a border with a digital, digital device like a cell phone? All these things implicate that longstanding duty to protect client confidential information. So those are just a few examples I could give more, but the point really here is that within long-standing existing rules, you can already see why technological competence is important for lawyers meeting their professional obligations. Another thing I'd like to, to point out is that it isn't uh, just law societies talking about this. Judges too are recognizing a duty of technological competence more and more. And you'll see the quote from Justice Myers on the screen there in a recent case stating, with the current pace of change, everyone has to keep learning technology, counsel and the court alike have a duty of technological competence. So judges too are recognizing this. That's a recent case. We can go backwards in jurisprudence and find more judges talking about this in different contexts. Here's a case from uh, 2010 from an Alberta court and uh, where you have the judge noting among other things that the practice of law has evolved to a point where computerized research is no longer a matter of choice. So in other words, the judge is recognizing using a particular type of technology for a particular type of lawyering task, in this case, legal research, was a basic part of lawyer uh, competence. So looking back to that question, is this a new duty of technological competence? In some senses, no even if you are in a jurisdiction who hasn't, that hasn't adopted this commentary, even prior to this commentary, I would argue there's a strong case that lawyers have a duty of technological competence. So in some ways, there's, uh, there's not necessarily newness about this. Um, on the other hand, I do think there, there's something new 
about explicitly recognizing in commentary that lawyers do have a duty of technological competence. Um, it's an important signal, I think, and I think it also underscores the importance of this duty. The fact that the majority of Canadian law societies are recognizing this is something we need to include within our ethics guidance to lawyers or ethics rules. Um, so when, when lawyers hear, and I think there are, there are a few lawyers in the audience, but when lawyers hear about a duty of technological competence, one that's being more explicitly recognized, one that may be part of their new professional conduct rules, they often want to know, understandably, what does this mean on a practical level? They want to know what am I required to do, or perhaps also conversely, what should I not be doing? Uh, they want to know what does this all mean? Uh, sometimes underlying these questions is some anxiety. Some people ask, um, are we all going to have to become coders now or tech experts? Some lawyers note that these aren't skills they have um, and perhaps skills that they're not planning on learning. They didn't, they'll say they didn't go to law school to become computer programmers. They went to law school to be lawyers. There's also sometimes some anxiety about um, regulation. You know, is the law society, now that it's recognized this duty, going to come into our offices, start auditing the technology we use? They're going to start forcing us to buy new fancy computers, expensive softwares, a sense that this may be all overwhelming. So uh, in, in the good news part of the presentation, I, I suggest people don't need to be anxious. Um, as with all aspects of lawyer competence, perfection is not the standard. Lawyers absolutely do not need to become coders or tech experts to meet their duty of technological competence. Uh, we're talking about, again, using relevant technology that's reasonably available. Lawyers don't need to buy the most complicated, most expensive equipment or software to meet this duty. Um, it's going to be very context specific, depending on what you're practicing and where you're practicing. And again, it, as I indicated earlier, I think <clears throat> it involves a sense of proportionality. So what's reasonable for a lawyer to be doing is going to depend on where they practice, what their clients need, um, and what area of practice they're in. So all that to say, I'd, I'd encourage lawyers not to be overwhelmed by this duty. Um, at the same time, I'd encourage them not to be dismissive either. Um, there's real benefits to using technology and using it well. Um, it can make a lawyer's life easier. It can result in better services to a client. Uh, so why not embrace uh, learning more? Why not uh, try to engage with best practices? Um, in terms of that question, what are some potential best practices? I don't have time uh, today to go into a lot of detail. And again, I've said context many times already today. It's, it's really gonna depend on the context in which the lawyer is practicing. On the area of best practices, I would say, I think this is something that law societies could be doing more of in terms of providing guidance to lawyers. Um, I've heard lawyers say they wish law societies were providing a bit more guidance. One, one good place to look right now, I think is in CPD programming. There are you know, an increasing array of conferences, events, panels um, that are doing a good job providing education in this area. So I invite you to check those opportunities out uh, when you see them. Uh, another piece of best practice guidance I direct you towards is this document entitled Legal Ethics in a Digital Context. It's something that a colleague and I developed um, last year or so um, for the Canadian Bar Association. It's about a 50 page document, very comprehensive, very practical, has things like checklists um, for the resources. It talks about things like due diligence and choosing technology, how to appropriately safeguard and manage your digital data, working remotely, how to ethically market your services online. And this is free, it's not paywalled, it's free to anyone um, on the CBA website. You can Google that title, uh, the link's there as well on the screen. Um, okay, so now to part two. Um, so, so far I've outlined where this idea of a lawyer's duty of technological competence has come from. I've outlined pretty quickly and pretty basically some of its basic parameters. Um, and so now I want to look forward. What is this duty going to require going forward? What are the emerging issues? How can we think more expansively about this concept? Um, and just to situate the future, uh, so to speak, I have a few quotes on this uh, slide here. 
Um, the first one's from Daniel Katz, and you'll see he says, with each doubling of processor speed, having of data storage costs, and major advances in machine learning, the possibility frontier is opening up and doing so at a drastically non-linear rate. And the point here is really that there's a technical acceleration with this stuff. Change is not going to be happening at the same pace as it was happening 20 years ago, or even a couple of years ago. And you'll see it towards the bottom of the screen, a second quotation from the Attorney General of Ontario roughly two years ago, where he was indicating how COVID was the catalyst that allowed the, the legal profession to move forward on court modernization, uh, move forward on court modernization 25 years and 25 days. Um, and I added that quote too, because we have you know, first that technical acceleration, but layered on top of it, we also have a policy or political acceleration happening too, uh, more willingness to adopt technology in courts and the justice system. And I think you know, this environment together really does open up uh, the horizons of what lawyer technological competence will mean going forward. In terms of how I, I think about what it might mean going forward, um, this is something I've, I've been thinking about for a while. Um, I've come up with what I call a 7A taxonomy of lawyer technological competence. And, and indicating in that taxonomy, the modern lawyers need to be automated, alert to emerging technological risks, operate as avatars, so competently deliver services digitally, be data analysts, use AI to augment their legal practices, be acquainted with emerging AI technologies, and be attentive to how AI is being used in the justice system. And in the time that remains, I'll go through each of these seven A's. Um, and the, the idea here is really just to highlight some emerging topics, give a sense of what the future might hold, and some of the important aspects of lawyer competency as we move forward. Uh, so the first A, automation. Um, in some ways, this is you know, one of the less futuristic parts of the taxonomy, really referring to tools that use automation to assist things like client intake. So for example, you have a tool where the client puts their information once, and that, that bio, like biographical information, and then the tool populates various aspects of your system, automated forms. These are things that many, many lawyers are using already. Uh, I do think you know, at the use of more automation is likely gonna be increasingly considered part of basic competent practice, part of what it means to provide efficient and quality legal services. Looking a bit ahead on the automation front, I, I thought I might um, highlight a, a couple of emerging automation tools for you. Um, one a newer, more advanced type of tool, uh, a document automation tool, that's now available as, as something called the Case Brief Generator. And a few companies are offering this now commercially available for what I've, from what I've seen um, only in the United States so far. Um, an example of one of these tools you can see on the screen here, it's called Compose. Um, and what this tool suggests that it does is it prepares a first draft of your written arguments for a motion. The way it works, uh, again, according to the tool, is that you select the particular type of motion you're doing from a set list of motions. And then it'll have a series of different types of potentially relevant arguments uh, that are applicable in your jurisdiction. You click and add those to your draft. Next step, you add your facts um, into the, the motion, uh, at which point then this tool syncs with its machine learning uh, legal research tool that aims to provide um, fact, uh, factually pertinent uh, precedent for you to have within your brief. Um, the idea here is then you have a, a good first draft of your arguments, um, particularly when it may be a more routine type of motion, it can save a lot of time. Um, so that's a case brief generator. Um, there's also some companies now aiming to provide legal memo, automated legal memo, research memos, um, where again, it's a situation where you put in facts and the computer tries to generate a legal research memo for you. Um, it'll be interesting to see how common these tools might become. Uh, what impact they'll have on the delivery of legal services. I've, I've heard from you know, some Canadian law firms interest in these. Uh, maybe in the audience, some people have already used some of these tools. I'd be interested in hearing about it. Um, but it's something on the radar um, and we'll have to wait and see the extent to which uh, this is a tool that becomes more commonplace. Um, 
Often when we're talking about technology, we may focus on the private sector. I wanted to give a, a public sector example um, and use the example of rules as code. Uh, for people that may have not heard this term, um, this basically involves a technique of taking rules that are written uh, in English or French and talking about Canada and converting them into machine re readable data and code. Um, people who promote this technique um, talk about bringing clarity, transparency, making rules less ambiguous, simpler to understand inter and interpret, potentially simpler to enforce. Um, it's also been argued that this type of format can make it easier to model changes to legislation or, pol uh, or policy reforms. Uh, there's, a, there's a conversation internationally about rules of as code. Um, here in Canada, the, the federal government the Canadian School of Public Service has a long-term rules as code project, um, which I, as I understand it has undertaken different exploratory projects aimed at legislative drafting, aimed at service automation as well. Um, certainly those who are um, um, pursuing this type of technique recognize that it's not gonna be a one size fits all solution, that it's gonna potentially, if it's useful, be useful when you have you know, very prescriptive, very quantifiable types of rules. Um, no one is suggesting that we try and make uh, an encoded self-executing charter of rights and freedoms. That's not what this technique's about. Um, we'll have to see to the extent that this technique uh, is seen as useful or becomes used elsewhere. Um, I think it's a good example of, you know, how technology may come to infuse all areas of law practice. So even something like legislative drafting, where you might not think of um, things like automation or computer code <clears throat> being super relevant. Um, there are new technologies that people are looking to apply. Uh, now on to my uh, second A, being alert to emerging cybersecurity risks. So our, our lawyers on top of the latest cybersecurity risks, we do know that these uh, attacks are becoming increasingly sophisticated. What is next? lawyers need to be prepared. Um, I don't have time to kind of go through a full cybersecurity uh, 101, um, maybe highlight a few things for you. So one is uh, the issue of phishing. Many of you may be quite familiar with this. It's essentially uh, when someone uses um, an email or a text or a phone call, and it appears to come from someone who's trusted like your bank or something or your boss, but it's actually from a third party imposter. Um, and the article on the screen there um, talks about a major Canadian law firm uh, becoming embroiled in a $2.5 $2 million scam as a result of phishing. And I thought, you know, one really particularly interesting thing in this article is just the details about how sophisticated um, these attacks are becoming. Um, so I'll be quoting from the article here, but it's the article talks about cyber criminals spending an average of 18 to 36 days, days in the environment, so in your law firm's computer system. They read the emails, they see who you're talking to, and they understand who you're gonna pay and when you're gonna make that payment. And so then what they do is they wait for the right opportunity, they look for the right time. And at that time, they write a carefully written email that looks like it's continuing the conversation that's already um, been going on. They'll probably tells you um, that they've changed bank accounts and to send the money to a new bank account. That's what happened, I think, uh, in this case. Um, and as noted in the article, the email may come from a dom domain name that can be easily mistaken for a legitimate sender. Um, but if you look carefully, potentially, you know, there'll be a small change. So maybe the letter L in the original email will be substituted for the number one in the spoofed account. Um, again, there's quite sophisticated techniques. Um, I was pretty surprised when I read that originally, just how long uh, people can lurk within email systems to generate the circumstances for these types of crimes. Um, more on that kind of future horizons front, um, deep fakes is something I think that is interesting. Um, what happens when cyber criminals start approaching law firms with video or audio that sounds like a client, but is actually an imposter? And you'll see on the screen here, a uh, relatively recent news story out of the United States that involved a Philadelphia lawyer who almost wired $9,000 uh, to a criminal who is impersonating his son's voice. Um, there are certainly concerns and understandable concerns about what might happen if deep fakes start to be used in courtrooms. This is not, I, I haven't heard at all of this being a regular issue yet, 
Um, there is one reported case that I've, I've heard about involving a child custody matter in the UK, uh, where apparently one party used a widely available software to doctor the voice of their spouse to make it sound like they had a recording of them making threats. Um, so I, I don't think we need to be um, you know, super worried about deep fake court evidence now. Um, is this an issue that lawyers may have to be worried about in the near or medium term? Possibly. Um, I say, you know, already now, this is something where lawyers should have a basic awareness, even if it's not something happening regularly. The technology is out there. On to the third A, lawyers operating as avatars. Lawyers, and I think the pandemic made this so clear, um, are increasingly having to deal, are dealing with how to de ethically deliver legal services digitally to clients, how to have an ethical online presence. COVID's pushed us to things like remote commissioning, much more to virtual hearings. And this is emerging, it's already a key competency area, obviously in certain types of practices. One good thing is I do think it's an area where we do see, um, we have seen a lot of good guidance emerge over the last few years. Um, there's, there's a few really great um, best practices documents related to virtual hearings. I think when the pandemic started, the law societies really stepped up quite well provide guidance on remote commissioning and witnessing. Um, I do think that first bullet point, lawyers and social media is much more thorny. Um, we're increasingly seeing lawyers active on various platforms. We know law societies are rece receiving more complaints. Um, how do we achieve the correct balance between freedom of expression and civility online? Norms are different on social media than in the courtroom. Um, on the other hand, if someone's engaging in harassment, discrimination, breaching client confidentiality, some might question whether or not the law societies are doing enough. Um, but I do think this is an area where we need to be thinking it through more, how to best guide and regulate lawyers in the social media space is clearly not going away. Um, and so I think, I think we need to think about it and, and think about how we can best guide lawyers. Technology can also intersect with the legal ethics of marketing. Here is a lawyer's daily article on geofencing. And geofencing in this con context basically refers to a technique whereby a lawyer can deliver location-based uh, digital advertisements to smartphone, form, smartphone users. Um, how this work, you'll see the first paragraph on the, on the slide there. It talks about a woman Here's a hypothetical. A woman surfs the internet in a hospital um, emergency department after hurting her ankle on a slip and fall on a public property. On the website she visits, she notices an advertisement for a local personal injury law firm, um, and it keeps showing up, an ad which follows her around for days. So essentially, someone's in an emergency department, and all of a sudden, they get these um, ads from a personal injury law firm, because that firm is targeting people who are attending that uh, emergency department. As this article details, there's some questions about how this practice um, intersects with privacy law. There's been some American state bars that have provided guidance um, about the legal ethics of this. Um, we know generally our, uh, at least in Ontario, our rules on marketing uh, direct lawyers not to use means to take advantage of vulnerable people um, or people who have suffered a, a recent traumatic experience. Uh, so if a lawyer is intending to use such a tool, uh, you know, one basic point is they really, really need to understand what the tool is actually doing technically. And that, that's sometimes where people uh, run into trouble with some of these issues. Um, but they also need to think about how it impacts their legal and ethical obligations as well. Um, when I first came up with this, um, it's my third A, lawyers as avatars, I, I thought maybe it was potentially a bit of an ill fit because what I was talking about at that time was really delivering services digitally, going to virtual hearings, things like that. Um, and I was wondering, you know, is that really the best word choice? Um, since that time, one interesting development is a talk of the metaverse. And there's growing chatter globally about lawyers opening offices there. And lawyers have actually started buying property and opening offices there. Um, so this is lawyers kind of literally taking up space as avatars. I meant it kind of notionally before. Here's an article uh, from England a few weeks ago. Here's an article um, last month from a Canadian publication. Um, and it links to a podcast with, uh, that interviews a lawyer who's recently opened um, Canada's first metaverse law office. 
what the future holds for law offices and metaverse. I, it's, I think it's too early to say. I certainly wouldn't um, deign to offer a prediction. Um, it does give an example, though, I think, is of how the intersection of lawyering and technology is always evolving. There's, there's always something new coming up. Um, moving to the fourth A, um, lawyers being data analysts. Um, as we now come to live in a digital world, as we have access to more and more data, including digital legal data, including more business data, is data literacy a competency that lawyers need? Jennifer Marsh, a legal analyst, analyst in the US, has talked about the, needs for, the need for lawyers to have a basic understanding of how data is collected, how to use data to influence decisions, how to recognize common data problems that might impact the results. And I think she's right on this. I think there's going to be increasing pressures on lawyers to be able to use and analyze digital data in new ways. Um, here's a screenshot from the Toronto law firm, Lensner Slat. They have a data-driven decisions project. They describe it as using available data analytics technology to provide better advice to their clients. They also note that they're, they're developing their own proprietary data sets and analytics in order to provide the best possible advice to clients. Uh, and so, for example, uh, the firm has prepared a database of every substantive decision from the Federal Court of Appeal and patent disputes from 2000 onward. They prepared a data set with approximately 30 characteristics of each appeal uh, decision. And the firm says that they see this database as assisting it in providing clients with benchmarks for things like the likelihood of success in a case, um, timelines for resolution, things like that. And, and law schools are increasingly starting to offer legal data science courses as well. Here's an announcement from our faculty. Um, I know it's being done elsewhere as well. Perhaps if you teach at a law school, at your law school too. What about lawyers using AI in their work? Um, depending on how one defines AI, um, we're not really seeing you know, regular profound uses in legal yet. Um, we certainly aren't at risk of being replaced by robot lawyers, um, but it's reasonable to predict that lawyer uh, AI will change lawyering in some notable ways. Already, AI use has been characterized as modest but increasing. I think that's fair. Um, there's some tools already being used fairly regularly, predictive coding that uses algorithms to help with e-discovery, so technology-assisted review or computer-assisted review. Um, AI-empowered legal research tools, AI-empowered contract analytics tools that can take large batches of contracts, identify areas of risk, identify pertinent clauses. Um, so that is a tool that can really cut down on the time needed uh, when you're doing something like due diligence, for example. Uh, legal analytics is a, of a particular interest to me. These are tools that use big data sets and machine learning to draw insights about cases um, or to draw insights about stakeholders involved in these cases, essentially tracking patterns. Um, you'll see some examples of functionality on the screen uh, here. Most of the tools um, you know, um, on a, on a quantitative, quantified basis are American, um, but we are seeing tools in Canada as well. Here's an example, and you may have seen that LexisNexis has now launched it's judicial analytics tool in Canada. It's called Context. And it's marketed as using an language analytics to help litigators craft arguments using the words in case law that a judge has historically shown pre uh, preference for. Uh, on to the second last A now. I should be wrapping up within the next five minutes or so. Um, the need to be acquainted with uh, emerging AI technologies. And here, I mean to step away from the question of what lawyers are using themselves and towards the question of understanding how AI might otherwise arise in their practice. Is it technology that's being used by their client? Is it technology that's being used to present um, or produce evidence in court? For example, something like facial recognition software. Um, not only will lawyers need to have baseline technical knowledge, they'll need some familiarity with some of the basic terms. Um, they'll also need to know where to turn, uh, how and when to bring in necessary expert assistance. Uh, the, the, the point here is simple that as these technologies become into broader use within society, they're going to be popping up in the legal context more often. 
and lawyers are going to be forced to engage. And that's going to require some level of competency. It doesn't mean the lawyers need to understand in a very detailed technical way what these tools do. But again, there'll be a need to understand basic concepts, issue spot, things like that. The last A, the need to be attentive. Um, lawyers have an ethical duty to try and approve the administration of justice, which includes a basic commitment to the concept of equal justice for all within an open, ordered, and impartial system. So what, what are lawyers' obligations in relation to AI? Not when they're using it, not when their clients are using it, but when it's actually potentially embedded within the justice system, embedded with the administrative um, system as well. And here I'd argue that being aware of the risks and potential benefits of using AI is going to be part of the legal profession's obligations as caretakers of the fair and equal administ administration of justice in Canada. And I'll already note uh, a few years back, the American Bar Association certainly recognized this. They issued a, a resolution um, that urged lawyers to, among other things, address the emerging ethical and legal issues relating to the use of AI in the practice of law, uh, including bias, explainability, and transparency of automated decisions. And so I just talked about automated decisions. This concept of automated decision-making is one that's um, pretty um, prominent and when people talk about uses of advanced technology in legal systems. Um, some people may have heard that term. Some people may be um, produce scholarship on, on that term and may be very familiar. Um, for those that aren't familiar, um, automated decision making really refers, you know, most basically to a technology that either assists or replaces the judgment of human decision makers. And, and a very high, high profile example of automated decision making in the legal context has been uh, the use of bail algorithms. And so it's where you have um, someone's profile, facts about someone that's fed to a, a technological tool, which then uses an algorithm to generate a risk assessment. Um, that's then given to a judge who's making a bail determination. And the reason this is high profile is uh, there has been some reporting um, suggesting that there's pretty significant problems with these tools. Here we're talking about tools being used in the United States. One study that got a lot of attention was a ProPublica report on what's called the Compass Bail Algorithm in the United States. And maybe this is something you've heard of before. In short, uh, it found that the system was differently calibrated for black individuals as opposed to white individuals. Uh, and that black uh, defendants were proportionately more likely to receive recidivist predictions at a higher rate than the actual rate of recidivism, which meant that black defendants were more likely uh, to be denied bail based on a biased technology. Um, certainly the company took some issue with this reporting. Um, one, one huge challenge in understanding these sorts of tools I'd, I'd mentioned is, is that they're really a black box and people have written about this um, uh, AI tools being black boxes. And what that means is it's, it's not always very clear about how they're generating assessments. Even people with a high degree of technical sophistication may not be able to discern why an algorithm arrived at a particular conclusion, a particular recommendation. Um, in the legal system, another big um, uh, issue has been, and there's been cases about this, that companies developing these tools, even if they're used for justice system applications, may try and claim that their software is proprietary. And that becomes a big problem when you're litigating these cases because uh, you may not be able to um, get the code, for example, to understand how this tool actually worked. There's been some litigation on this, particularly in the United States, with some success, um, but it has been a, a big issue. All this to say is when we talk about automated decision making, uh, there's lots of things here that are going to demand the legal profession's attention. And we don't have bail algorithm, algorithms in Canada, um, <clears throat> at least not, not to my knowledge, um, but this issue is much broader than bail tools. Um, I, I won't be able to go into to much detail today, but you'll see on the screen there, um, it's a list that's from a report generated from, by the Law Commission of Ontario. Uh, it was looking at the use of AI and ADM, which is automated decision-making across the world. And you'll see that there's other examples in the criminal justice system, things like parole determination, 
Also a big area has been with respect to assessing immigration eligibility and status. And there are some controversies and applications in Canada related to that, um, allocating government benefits. Um, all that to say again is to underscore that these uses are already being considered in the justice system uh, with administrative decision makers and you know, really can potentially infuse so many areas. And my point here is that as, as caretakers of the administration of law, uh, of the rule of law, um, we as lawyers have obligations to be engaged, um, to demand accountability and, and to, to demand systems that are consistent with our justice values. And on this topic of automated decision-making, I would note there's lots of great work emerging from academics who have their whole careers dedicated to this. Um, various nonprofits are um, looking at this issue as well. Um, so there's lots of great work to check out. That Law Commission report does footnote some of it, um, but it's, it's an area, if you do wanna learn more, there's lots of great resources. With that, I am at the end. I think I've, I've pretty, come pretty close to wearing out my welcome for my time. Um, in terms of final thoughts, I guess I would just say um, an obligation of lawyer uh, technological competence is here. It's here to stay. Uh, and what that means is understanding technology isn't optional for lawyers. There's things that lawyers need to know about. Um, there's technology that lawyers need to be using. Uh, it's also not a stagnant thing. As the use of technology changes in our society, in our legal systems, the obligations of lawyers are going to ebb and flow too. And I'll leave you from, uh, with this quote from Janice Clark, which I think is apt. She's written, uh, while the law has a long and distinguished past as a learned profession, it's only in the past decades, it's become clear that the law must also be a learning profession. Um, so I, I, I encourage you to uh, continue or to embark on your journeys of learning about lawyer technological competence. Once again, I'm very grateful for the time to speak to you today. And with the remaining time, I'm happy to address any questions. I'm happy to talk to any of you about these issues further. You can look up my email address and I welcome messages. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Amy, for that really interesting presentation. I uh, really enjoyed the comments. Um, I, I would, there's a, a, a comments in the chat on artificial intelligence for those who are interested in following that and kind of the history of uh, artificial intelligence efforts at uh, the law school here. Uh, I'm going to pick up some of the questions that appeared in the Q&A uh, while you were talking and in no particular order. Maybe I'll start with um, one that says, so the seven A's that you outlined in one of your slides um, might seem overwhelming to those lawyers who do not consider themselves technologically proficient. So what do you think the profession needs to do to ensure lawyers are supported in this learning and who is responsible for that? Okay. I think that's a, that's a wonderful question. I think a really relevant one. And yeah, when I talk about this topic, I get very excited and I want to put all these screenshots on the screen here. And I do sometimes worry that it does become overwhelming for people. Um, at the same time, you know, like I said, I think these are issues lawyers are going to have, have to deal with. Um, how can lawyers be better guided? Um, you know, I, I do think it was great the CBA stepped up to um, develop that document about legal ethics and digital context. Um, I have said elsewhere, and I, and I think I said today, I, I think law societies could be doing a better job providing lawyers with guidance. One great thing the Law Society of, of BC did a few years back is provided a lot of guidance about cloud computing, um, and that guidance has been used elsewhere as well. Could law societies provide um, you know, more lists of trusted providers of technology, um, more um, ethics opinions about how a lawyer should be using technology in their practice, things like that? I think definitely they can, and I think they're gonna to have to um, uh, soon. Um, law schools too, I think are implicated. Are we doing enough to make our education relevant to this century, to this year? Um, some law schools are offer offering courses. Uh, I know um, uh, like an Alexander School of Law in, in, in uh, Toronto is doing a great job trying to think about modernizing its curriculum. So I think it's kind of a group effort, um, um, but I think, I think right now, um, it, you know, we could be doing more to assist lawyers in meeting this duty. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, another question, uh, uh, maybe a bit provocative. Do you think the profession is hesitant to adopt technological proficiency because they are concerned it will impact the number of hours they can bill? 
And if so, how do we overcome this prioritization of profit over people receiving efficient and competent legal advice? Yeah, great question. I, I talked about that duty of efficiency and there's been some writing about that duty in general and you know, is it in tension with you know, desire to create profit? Um, you know, I, I would note with respect to, to that question, um, you know, we think about things like you know, more advanced AI tools and e-discovery or contract analysis. It's really coming to a point where um, it hasn't you know, limited the hours of, that lawyers do, but essentially just enhanced the work they've been able to do. They have so much more data coming to them. They can use these tools to really streamline their focus. So they can concentrate on the types of uh, work they want to be doing. Um, an example of, of that, those contract analysis tools is that I was a litigator, so I didn't do due diligence, but people who do diligence talk have told me that you know, when you do some of these big projects, sometimes you might only take a selection of a company's contracts to look at and then make an assessment based on that simply because a human eye can't take the whole, uh, all the time to look at all the contracts. You employ one of these technological tools, you're not reducing the hours that the lawyers are spending on it, but you're able to look at a much larger data set and then get the lawyers concentrated on the big picture questions. Um, so, you know, I, I can't speak for any individual lawyers, but, you know, I, I would say I haven't seen uh, an example per se where, uh, you know, suddenly adopting these technologies has, um, greatly reduce the ability of lawyers to um, deliver legal services and, and run a business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's one last question uh, in the Q&A, so I think we could uh, probably squeeze this one in. Is there a concern that if uh, British Columbia and Ontario have not adopted the new language, the model language, arguments based on implying the duty through existing provisions have become weaker or less valid? or that you know, failure to follow the model code shows that there's a conscious choice against the duty? Yeah, I mean, good, good question. I mean, I guess, you know, time, time will tell. Um, you know, I think time will tell whether or not these jurisdictions actually come to adopt these duties. I think it's potentially that they may. Um, you know, I think, you know, if you look at a jurisdiction like uh, BC, where they have these cloud computing due diligence guidelines, where lawyers are using technology in their daily practice, I think it's going to be hard pressed um, for anybody to argue before that regulator that their failure to use technology competently, let's say they you know, accidentally email their client's confidential information to a bunch of people, that somehow because that duty is not included in their code, that they're somehow exempt from their duty to protect confidential client information. You know, and it may take a you know, tribunal ru ruling to know for sure. Um, interesting comment, but I, I would think that still, um, just the realities of those existing duties would, would mandate that they, they do have those obligations. All right, Ella, thank you. And uh, with that, I mean, I think that uh, takes us out or takes to the end of time for questions. Um, so thank you very much to, to those who submitted questions. And uh, I'll just have a, a, a few words uh, to, to conclude the, today's events. So I would like to, once again, uh, thank Amy Salzen for visiting us today and giving what was a very engaging presentation. And I'm looking at the uh, uh, congratulations and, and, and kudos in, in the chat. So thank you very much for today's talk. Um, and a special thank you to our viewers um, for you know, joining this afternoon uh, as part of your already busy schedules. Um, I hope this was a valuable session for all of you. Um, please stay safe and healthy. Have a great weekend and thank you again, Amy, for, for a fantastic talk. Thank you so much, everyone.